we concluded from the last video that if you impose a tariff, it has the bad characteristic that you're going to hurt consumers by an amount, let's say $10, which is more than you're going to help domestic firms, which here is $7. And if you already have the tariff in place, then it seems like an attractive thing to do would be to adopt a two-part policy. The first part of the policy is eliminating the tariff. Now, that's going to hurt the domestic firms. They're going to lose $7 in profit. It's going to help the consumers a lot. It's going to help the consumers by $10. But it is going to hurt domestic firms, and we care about them too. We care about both domestic firms and consumers. So what I'm going to suggest is a two-part policy. The first part is eliminating the tariff. And then the second part is taxing the consumers For example, eight dollars, and giving the eight dollars that's a dollar sign to the to the domestic firms. With this two part policy, the first part benefits the consumers by $10 and hurts the domestic firms by 7 The second part hurts consumers by $8 and benefits domestic firms by $8. You can see that in net, the result is that, let's just do the math, for consumers, Elimination of the tariff makes them $10 better off. The $8 tax makes them $8 worse off, and so the net is plus 2. And for the firms, eliminating the tariff makes them $7 worse off, but giving them $8 from the consumers makes them $8 better off, and so their net is plus 1. So here you literally have a win-win policy that makes both consumers and firms better off. Now, this $8, you've got some flexibility about the $8. It could be $7, it could be $10. Any tax between $7 and $10 is going to make both the consumers and the firms better off as part of this two-part policy where you eliminate the tariff. And so this is what economists don't like about tariffs, that there's an alternative situation that doesn't have a tariff and makes everybody better off. Let's talk about some terminology. Economists call the situation that I've just described with the tariff an inefficient situation. And what this means is there's an alternative making someone better off and no one worse off. So. This is the definition of what economists mean by inefficient. A situation is inefficient if there's another situation that can make one or more person better off and nobody worse off. If there is such an alternative, you really want to go there. You don't want to stay where you are. And that's why we use this pejorative term of inefficient to describe this situation. A more technical term, Pareto improvement. This is named after, and your book discusses this, this is named after Vilfredo Pareto, an economist who was working around the time of World War I in Italy. Pareto improvement is defined as an improvement, as a policy, that makes someone better off and no one worse off. So, if, the, if a Pareto improvement is possible from where you are right now, it's possible to make someone better off and no one worse off, then where you are right now is inefficient. And the Pareto improvement would help everybody, or at least help some people and not hurt anybody. Now, there may be more than one Pareto improvement, 
And that's kind of one question is how do you decide which Pareto improvement to make? We're not going to get into that. Now notice that in this example with the tariff, the way to make a Pareto improvement is the joint policy. Just eliminating the tariff is not a Pareto improvement. If you just eliminate the tariff, yeah, consumers are going to rejoice, but firms are going to get hurt. That's not a Pareto improvement because somebody's gotten hurt. Pareto improvements mean nobody gets hurt. Another definition, we say that a situation is Pareto efficient if there's no way to make any Pareto improvements. In, uh, in other words, uh, this is the opposite of if inefficient. So we could actually say that inefficient is Pareto inefficient, but economists kind of as assume that because Pareto's ideas are the basic ideas here. Um, indeed, when, eco when economists use just the word efficient all by itself, it means the same thing as Pareto efficient. In fact, I, I should write this down, I, I probably should have typed it. The word optimal in this kind of social decision-making context, where you're talking about society as a whole, the word optimal is a synonym of efficient and Pareto efficient. Um, sometimes we also say Pareto optimal to make it clearer. Now, economists use the word optimal in other contexts, like optimal for the firm, which is profit maximization, or optimal for the consumer, which is maximizing something we call utility. But in a social decision-making context, optimal means pre-optimal, means efficient, means Pareto efficient. These all are synonyms. They mean exactly the same thing. And so the situation with the tariff is not a Pareto efficient situation because there's an alternative that's a Pareto improvement that can make everybody better off. Now, these notions are not controversial in economics. And what we're going to be doing over the course of this class, uh, particularly environmental economics, is we're going to be looking for situations that are inefficient because those are bad. And inefficient situations can be made better. And I'm going to describe in, in those situations what kind of policy, and it's usually a two-part policy, what kind of policy is going to be a Pareto improvement. And the reason these policies are two-part policies is because any policy, or, or most of these policies, are going to have winners and losers. So the two-part policy is going to be, one, adopt the policy, and then adopt the first part of the policy. And then, two, tax the winners and give the money to the losers so that you can develop a win-win. If you can develop a win-win, the original situation was inefficient. That's bad. We shouldn't do those things as long as we can really move to the efficient situation. So as I said, that's not controversial. The next thing I'm going to talk about, though, is really controversial. In fact, it should be more controversial than it is. It's called the Potential Pareto Principle. And it has synonyms as well. The potential Pareto principle is called the Caldor-Hicks principle. This is, if you pick up any textbook in law and economics, or most textbooks in law and economics, they'll talk about the Caldor-Hicks principle. And it's also the same as cost-benefit analysis, which is another thing that your book talks about and that, and that we'll talk about. Before defining it, let me give you an example. Let's go back to the tariff. Remember that the Pareto improving policy was eliminate the tariff tax the consumers and give the money to the firms. The potential Pareto principle says you should eliminate the tariff even if that's the only thing you do. That's totally different from the Pareto principle. The Pareto principle says you should do things that they don't hurt anybody. The potential Pareto principle says it's okay to hurt people. It's alright for society to hurt people. In fact, we the people who support the potential Pareto principle are going to recommend that society does hurt people. And in this kind of situation with the tariff, the, the adherents of the potential Pareto principle say, we're going to 
recommend that the government eliminate the tariff, even if the government isn't going to tax the consumers at all. Even if the, cons the firms are going to be hurt by, by seven bucks. We just sort of, we don't care. Now, that is very controversial. Uh, I am not alone among economists in thinking that uh, we don't have any business using the potential Pareto principle. Um, so let me let me give you some more examples. But uh, but basically, I don't agree with the potential Pareto principle. I'm not going to be using it in this class. As I said, I'm just going to be using Pareto. When I'm when I say a situation is bad, that's I'm going to show you a policy like this policy that's going to make everybody better. And if such a policy, well, okay. So let me talk about this some more. Potential Pareto says. Suppose you have four people in an economy, and each of them have one unit of stuff, maybe apples. So person A has one apple, person B has one apple, person C has one apple, and person D has one apple. Now I'm going to write it like one, 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 one. Suppose there's a possibility of going to a situation with five apples in the economy, but person A has all of them, and persons B, C, and D don't have any. The potential Pareto principle says if you have an option of going from 1111 to 5000, you should do it. You should go from 1111 to 5000 because from 5000 you could go to, for example, 21111 or one and a quarter, one and a quarter, one and a quarter, one and a quarter. What's really important is that the poten potential Pareto principle doesn't say you have to go to two, one, 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 or one and a quarter, one and a quarter. The potential Pareto principle says even if you're just going from one, 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 one to five, zero, 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 and then you stay at five, zero, 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 that's what the society should have done. So, the bottom line for potential Pareto Okay, the word potential here is, is related to this idea of could. But the bottom line of potential Pareto is if society has a choice between 1111 and 5000, society should always prefer 5000. Why? Because it has this hypothetical, theoretical potential to be something different. Now, economists have been... Uh, so Caldor and Hicks... Uh, Caldor wrote the paper in, I think, 1939. Uh, Hicks also, I think, in 1939 or 1940. Um, so they have different versions, slightly different versions of what they were looking at. Um, and very shortly thereafter, economists started publishing papers criticizing Calder and Hicks. So this is a very controversial uh, principle in economics. Um, I think, unfortunately, it's too widely used. One of the things that I've been doing research on recently is on how widely used it is. It's used, as I said, in law and economics. Um, it's used in making environmental decisions. The Reagan administration required uh, ever since the Reagan administration, the Environmental Protection Agency has been required to use cost-benefit analysis whenever it promulgates any regulation. And cost-benefit analysis is another name for the Calder-Hicks principle, which is another name for the potential Pareto principle. Now, in actual practice, it has so many ethical problems because you can see that that it can advocate moving to a very unequal distribution that I don't think in reality the EPA really applies it in its raw form. I think they've made tweaks, thank goodness. But in its raw form, the Keller-Hicks principle basically says we don't care about distribution, we just care about how much stuff the economy has. And in some sense, that's almost as bad as a mercantilist idea. It, what economists really ought to care about is the utility of individual consumers. It is the happiness of individual consumers, not 
how much stuff the economy produces. And so I think potential Pareto is putting the focus of economics in completely the wrong direction. And as I say, I'm not alone. There, there are Nobel Prize winning economists who have said for decades that potential Pareto makes no sense and should be abandoned. But unfortunately, it's used very, very widely. And your book talks about potential Pareto. So um, I think that's all I'm going to say for now about this. I have one more thing to say about tariffs, but this video has got, gone too long, so I'm going to stop here and let that be a, a, a final video about that.